Hi folks, welcome to seven myths about the New Testament that even some scholars still believe. Now, this video is one of my highlights video for my History One class. So I'm making this for my students as one of two videos on highlights from Unit 4. But if you're not in my class, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for watching and I hope you like this video. I'm going to run down the seven myths rather quickly, but all the detail is in the book Reading the Church Fathers, which is the textbook for the class. So um, if you want to find out more information about any of these myths, check out the chapter in the book on the canon and the New Testament. Okay, seven myths about the New Testament that even some scholars still believe. Now, the first myth is actually a two-for-one. It's two myths in one, or rather, two opposite myths, and the truth is in the middle, as it always is. My students know that. Okay, so the first myth is either that the canon was closed at a very early date, and the church knew exactly what its New Testament was from the end of the first century at the latest, and that was that, right? That is is not how it played out in the early church. Of course, we had the documents that make up our New Testament by the end of the first century, and I think they all were written before the turn of the second century, right? But there was some discussion that had to happen about which of these documents will actually make it into the New Testament. And so we, I talk about in the book what were the criteria for determining whether an early Christian document was going to become regarded as authoritative scripture and actually make it into the New Testament, and that process took a bit of time. Now, the opposite myth is that uh, the church didn't have a Bible at all until much later, that somehow the, uh, the latest dates that anyone could put on the, the uh, standardization or formalization of the canon are really like that's when we got our Bible, as if to say we didn't really have a New Testament for sure until the 4th century. Well, that's not true either. As I said, the documents for, uh, for our New Testament were written and for the most part were considered authoritative from the 1st century, but it took a little while for the church to come up with a standardized table of contents for the Bible, and especially for the New Testament. And the, the thing to keep in mind in all of this is that the Bible did not create the church. The church created the Bible, right? And as I always say, there's one thing in everybody's Bible that's not in Scripture, and that is the table of contents. And so always remember that the decisions about which documents would become the New Testament, those decisions were made by the early church, by the church fathers. So again, the, the Bible didn't give us the church, the church gave us the Bible, and it's the early Christians, the early church fathers, who decided what documents would be in the Bible. And so when you think about how you read the scriptures, you, you need to keep that in mind. But the myth of an early closed canon is not quite accurate, and the myth of a late Bible also not quite accurate. Both of these myths, two extremes, the truth is in the middle, and that's myth number one. Myth number two is what I call the myth of acceptable pseudonymity, and I have a video on this already, but it's kind of old. I'm planning to redo it, so if you watch that one, just understand that I was new at making videos then. Um, I am going to redo it, and if you're watching this, by the time I redo that and you watch that and it's new, then you know what happened. But anyway, the myth of acceptable pseudonymity goes something like this. The myth is that everybody in the ancient world wrote documents and put somebody else's name on it, and everyone was okay with that. And so the same is true of the New Testament, and that the New Testament documents, especially things like uh, some of the letters of Paul, etc., these are all pseudonymous, that they weren't written by Paul, but again, that's okay. They come from the same school of thought, or from Paul's disciples, or, or from someone who meant well, and so we can still consider them scripture, even if Paul didn't write them, etc. Well, that is a myth. 
If the myth were true, you'd be able to go back to the early Christian documents and read the early church fathers, and somewhere in there, someone would say, oh yeah, we know Paul didn't write this or that letter, but it's okay, etc. You don't find that at all. And in fact, I mentioned earlier, uh, I talk in the book about the criteria for determining what documents would make it into the New Testament. And the number one criterion is authorship. The point being that if, if the early Christians thought that Paul had not written Ephesians, for example, it would not be in your Bible. It is only in your Bible because they were convinced that Paul wrote it. And the same goes for the rest of the New Testament documents. So this idea of pseudonymity, right, that it was acceptable, that's a myth. Now, don't get me wrong. People in the ancient world did write documents and put other people's names on them. And we have examples of that in the early church. But the early church fathers refer to those examples as frauds, as um, as, as fakes, as not trustworthy. So again, the point being that, uh, you know, the idea that pseudonymity, that, that writing a document under someone else's name was acceptable and that a document like that could still make it into the New Testament, that is a myth. It's not true. All of the documents in your New Testament are there precisely because the church fathers, in their consensus, believed that they were written by the person whose name is on them. Okay, that brings us to myth number three, and I'm embarrassed to admit that this is the myth I believed the longest. Um, this is the myth of anonymous gospels, and I was taught this when I was in seminary, and the myth goes like this. Um, the, the names on the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, were added later. No one really knows who wrote them, the original manuscripts don't actually have the names on them, and therefore it's okay if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't write them because they're really written anonymously. Well, that too is a myth because when you actually do the homework on this, what you find out is there are no manuscripts of the Gospels that don't also have the author's name on them, and there are no manuscripts of the Gospels that have the wrong author's name on them. So, for example, there's no manuscript of Matthew with Mark's name on it, or, or Luke's, or somebody else's, right? The traditional authorship of the Gospels has been known and, and uh, confidently believed since the beginning. The Gospels are not anonymous works. They were written by the people whose names are on them. At least, that is what all the evidence points to. So anyone who wants to say the Gospels are anonymous or that they might have been written by someone other than whose name is on them, they have no evidence supporting that theory. So that's myth number three. Uh, the Gospels are not anonymous. And again, they are in the New Testament precisely because the early Christians believed that they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, two of them by actual disciples of Jesus, Matthew and John. Now that brings us to myth number four, the myth of the late Gospels. And I think the myth of the late Gospels comes from the idea that uh, Jesus was not really divine and could not predict or prophesy the fall of Jerusalem. So back in the day, scholars who saw in the Gospels where Jesus predicts the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, well, they reasoned that Obviously, that gospel must have been written after 70 AD so that the anonymous author could look back on the fall of Jerusalem and uh, create some prophecy, put it in the mouth of Jesus, you know, in the early 30s of the first century. Um, but, uh, but that whole concept is based on a need to diminish or deny the divinity of Jesus. So we're going to put that away right off the top. The, the Gospels were not written that late, and most likely Mark is probably written in the 50s or 60s, um, and, and we know that because Luke is written after Mark. And here's the thing, Luke has to be written before Acts, because in the book of Acts, the author, Luke, says that he's already written the Gospel. 
So, Mark has to be written before Luke, Luke has to be written before Acts, and the book of Acts has to be written before 64 AD, because that's when uh, there was the great fire in Rome, and the Romans begin persecuting the Christians. And within a, a year or two or three after that, both Peter and Paul are martyred. And there is simply no reason to think that the author of the book of Acts, Luke, would leave those things out of the story if they had already happened. The only possible reason that the book of Acts does not include the, the fire, the persecution by the Romans, and the martyrdoms of the, of the two most important apostles, Peter and Paul, the only reason those aren't in the book of Acts is because they have not happened yet when Luke wrote it. So that means Acts has to be written by the year 64 or so. So uh, Matthew might be written a little bit later, um, but you get the idea. So we are not talking about documents that were written in the late first century even. Uh, these documents, for sure, um, Mark and Luke and Acts were written by the mid-60s, no doubt. Matthew, I think, was written next, after Luke, and perhaps in the late 60s or even early 70s. Not exactly sure, but you get the idea. The Gospels were not written late. They are right there within a, a few decades of the events that they describe. Okay, now, the fifth myth about the New Testament is the myth of high and low Christology. And I think I have a video on this, too, from back in the day. But the myth goes something like this. Uh, some of the Gospels, or perhaps even the letters, uh, indicate or describe a Jesus who has a high Christology, meaning more divine, and other Gospels or other parts of the New Testament perhaps describe a Jesus who has a low Christology, meaning an emphasis on his humanity and perhaps even less divine, as though there were different views on this among the apostles. And none of that is true. And the proof of this is that you can look at the Gospel that is supposed to have the highest Christology, the Gospel of John, and in there you find some of the most important affirmations of Jesus' humanity. Like, for example, he eats even after the resurrection, you know, demonstrating that his resurrection body is a real physical human body. So it is not the case that some Gospels present us with a high Christology and emphasize Jesus' divinity, uh, or that some Gospels present us with a low Christology and emphasize his humanity. All four of the Gospels, and indeed, you know, going on through the letters of the New Testament, all of that presents us with a Christology in which Jesus has two natures. He is both divine and human. And that becomes really important for the early church because the heresies of the early church are those Christologies that either emphasize Jesus' divinity so much that they diminish or deny his humanity, right? The Docetics and the Gnostics. Or they emphasize his humanity uh, to the extent that they diminish his divinity, or perhaps they de deny his divinity altogether, the Judaizers, the Ebionites, and then adoptionists in general, right? And so if we want to talk about high Christology, we can talk about a Christology that's kind of too high in a sense that it diminishes his humanity, but again, that's that's Gnosticism. If we want to talk about a low Christology, we can talk about a Christology that's too low in the sense that it that it denies his uh, divinity, but but again, that's a heresy. That would be adoptionism. Orthodox mainstream Christology, the Christology of the apostles that was handed down to the early church uh, church fathers. That is a balanced Christology in which Christ is affirmed as having two natures, fully human and fully divine. The Gospels do not give us an unbalanced picture of Jesus. All of the Gospels give us the full picture of Jesus, although each in their own way. And so all four of the canonical Gospels have a Christology that is neither too high nor too low, but right where it needs to be because, after all, these were written by people 
who knew and who knew Jesus personally. Myth number six is the myth of Q. And this is a huge topic, and everybody studies this in seminary. And so, again, I'm only going to just introduce it. And if you want all the details, you got to go to the book, um, Reading the Church Fathers. But um, Q, if you don't know what Q is, it is a hypothetical, i.e. made-up, gospel source that supposedly existed in the time of the early church that was then a source for material that you find in Matthew and Luke, right? So in other words, scholars have speculated that there was another gospel that we don't have that Matthew and Luke got material from. And of course, you know, this is consistent with the idea that Matthew's gospel wasn't written by one of the disciples, etc. Um, but again, if this were true, then you could go back to the early church read the documents of the church fathers and find hints or clues or someone mentioning this other source. But there is nothing. There is no evidence for anything like Q. It simply didn't exist. And this demonstrates the danger of trying to do New Testament studies apart from patristics, apart from early Christian studies, because the New Testament is read sort of in a vacuum as though the only evidence that, that is relevant is in the text itself, right? But without studying the context, this is what happens. You come up with these speculations of things that never existed. Now, don't get me wrong. There were other Gospels that were written, but they were written by the heretics. There were Gnostic Gospels. There were Ebionite Gospels. But, but the problem with that is that they were written to be anti-Gospels. They were written in opposition to the canonical Gospels, and they were never considered for inclusion in the New Testament. So these are not lost books of the Bible. These are books written by people who are in the process of separating themselves from the mainstream church. So in any case, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I believe, were written in the order, in this order, Mark, Luke, Matthew, John. Now, I could be wrong about that, and that's okay, but the problem is there or the the point is there is no need to speculate on another gospel all of the explanations for the differences between the gospels can have simpler explanations than a a made up gospel that didn't exist that we we would then have to speculate on what was in it forget that there is no such thing as q this the the hypothesis of q is a made-up answer to an unnecessary question. So Q is a myth, forget about it. And finally, myth number seven, the myth of the telephone game, right? Uh, sometimes you will hear people talk about uh, the scriptures, uh, especially the New Testament, and then the writings of the church fathers or the, the practices of the early church, and they'll say, well, you know, it's like the telephone game, how as it gets passed on, the message changes, right? But the problem is that the telephone game works the way it does precisely because the message is whispered into the ear of someone and the others can't hear it. But the telephone game doesn't work if you speak the message out loud and everyone around the table hears it because then there's no opportunity for it to get corrupted, right? When you play the telephone game, uh, you whisper a secret message to a person who only gets to hear it once, whispered, right, which increases the the uh, possibility that it's going to get misheard, and then, you know, it's like a copy of a copy getting more and more corrupted. But that is not at all how early Christianity works. First of all, the message was proclaimed out loud, heard by multiple people who could corroborate each other, correct each other, and provide the checks and balances, right? But the other thing you have to remember is that ancient culture is a memorization culture, right? These people did not have their attention spans and their ability to memorize things diminished the way we have by the luxuries of being able to watch things on screens or have things immediately available uh, in, in, in paper copies, right? They, they often didn't even own or, or have access to read their own scriptures for themselves on a page. They only heard the scriptures, but they memorized them. And so this, this 
memorization culture means that the message that gets written down in the in the New Testament and then that gets passed down through apostolic succession is trustworthy, right? And so we can trust what's in our New Testament. At least we can trust the Greek text of the New Testament. And I have other videos where I talk about how there are some English translations of the New Testament that are not trustworthy, and that's unfortunate, but it is the case. But the point is, is that we have not lost anything um, through time. The only thing we we risk losing is when when we're the, at the mercy of a bad translation. Okay, those are the seven myths about the New Testament that even some scholars still believe. Again, like I said, I went through them pretty quickly, but if you want all the details, uh, check out Reading the Church Fathers from Sophia Institute Press. And um, as my students know, you know, there's a chapter in here on the development of the canon, and it's all in there. I'm just going to close with this thought, um, because when it comes to translating the Bible into English, uh, there are different approaches, and then there are different ways to interpret what's been translated, and, and that is a bit of a process. But I just want to say this, if you think that the meaning of Scripture is plain and on the surface, or if you think that interpretation of Scripture must always lean into the literal, right? Try this challenge. Here's the challenge. Compare the Hebrew Old Testament with the Septuagint, which is the Old Testament translated into Greek. Now, you don't even have to know Hebrew and Greek or be able to do the translation yourself to do this. You can read what is probably just in your Bible that you already have, uh, an English translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and then get yourself a copy of the English translation of the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, keeping in mind that this was translated from Hebrew into Greek by rabbis who are supposedly uh, you know, in personally invested in making an accurate translation of their own Hebrew text into Greek, right? So keeping in mind that the Septuagint is considered by these rabbis to be a legitimate translation of the Hebrew. Then compare them. Compare the Hebrew to the Greek and look at the differences and look at what was understood to be a legitimate translation of the Hebrew into Greek, right? And, and look at how they are often very different. Then look closely at the New Testament and see how the apostles and Jesus were reading the Septuagint. They, they, they might have read the Hebrew text in their liturgy, but when they, uh, when they were reading the Bible, when Jesus, when Jesus is quoting the Bible and when the apostles are quoting the Old Testament in the Gospels, they are reading the Septuagint. They're reading the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And you will be amazed at how they interpret Scripture. And I guarantee you, if you take this challenge, this is the cure for a fundamentalist reading of Scripture because you will realize that Jesus and the apostles did not read Scripture that way. And if you want more on that, you want to check out my book, Reading Scripture Like the Early Church. And, um, and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. We should be doing the interpretation of Scripture the way Jesus and the apostles did. Why wouldn't we? Okay, there you have it. Seven myths about the New Testament that even some scholars still believe. And if you don't believe me, check out the book. All the footnotes are in here. All the evidence is in here. All the details are in reading the Church Fathers. So, Thanks for joining me. See you next time. Hey, thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I really appreciate that. Please share this video with your friends and please join me in the Original Church Community on Locals.com. Don't forget that if you join the Original Church Community on Locals.com, you can join me each week for a live, in-depth, chronological Bible study. It's live streamed every Saturday, but you can watch it later if you're not available. So join me for that and I'll see you there. I hope to see you there. I hope to see you there, and I'll see you there.